Hey everybody, welcome back. Thanks for joining the first session with a bunch of brilliant minds. I was really excited to see from those people, uh, a lot of who I've, I follow on social media and I feel like I need to be paying attention to every word that they say. We have another great voice in uh, data and analytics today. Uh, his name is Matt Mullins. He is CTO of, Co uh, of Cogenity. Uh, he and I sounds like have a lot in common. Um, he is probably an actual philosopher. I am a, uh, a, a very accidental philosopher. Uh, he is a bike rider and I am also a bike rider. So uh, it's great to have you here, Matt. We're, since it's the Summer of Data conference, uh, we're asking everybody a, a off the wall question um, uh, about summer. And so the question I have for you today is uh, when you're out kind of like, doing your thing in the sun in the summer, what is that philosophical question that kind of like keeps running through your head? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, going deep, like right, right out of the gate. <laughs> yeah, what's the lightest, lightest one then? The, I'll tell you, you know, I'm getting, uh, I'm getting close to uh, 50. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about, about aging and, you know, what that latter half is going to look like and, you know, <laughs> how I can approach this philosophically. Um, oh, gosh, I, uh, that's one thing that we, the age is something we don't have in common, but the fear of age is something <laughs> we do have in common. Uh, well, well, thanks for joining us here today. I'm looking forward to the, the talk. Uh, again, this is uh, Matt Mullen, CTO of Cogenity, and his talk is right in front of you. So Matt, thanks and take it away. All right. Thanks, Trevor. Um, so as Trevor said, I'm the CTO for Cogenity, and um, I'm going to spend some time talking about collaboration and data and probably actually less time talking about um, pipelines. So um, a little bit about Cogenity. So we're a young startup. We're about two years old. Um, we were founded in uh, March of 2020. And so uh, if you think back to March of 2020, um, we were founded right at the same time as the uh, COVID pandemic hit. And so um, a week before we were going to have our uh, executive retreat, um, all international travel was shut down and all domestic travel was shut down. And so for the first two years of our organization, we were never able to be really in the same room. And so we've always been a 100% um, remote organization. And that's given us a lot of opportunity to think about um, collaboration, especially async collaboration, and collaboration in the data and analytics space, um, you know, working remote like that. So um, we think that there's really five principles to uh, collaborative intelligence for a data and analytics practice. Um, one is the focus on outcomes over output, um, empowering business teams, treating data as a product, fostering collaboration and curating uh, the best analytics. And so today I'm gonna talk mostly about number four, which is fostering collaboration um, and I may push into some of these other five a little bit um, just because of the, the interrelatedness. So we had access to some analysts. And so we took a segment and we asked them, you know, how important is the act of collaboration uh, to your work and to your work process? And um, unsurprisingly, um, for the majority of them, um, it was of great importance. Um, the fairly important part of the way that they work. And here we were specifically asking about, you know, collaborating over the um, analytic de development. And so, you know, again, a lot of times I think these things aren't surprising, but you know, we discovered that users in the enterprise especially want to collaborate. They want to use other people's SQL code. So almost 90% of the survey respondents need to use SQL shared by someone else. Um, they share SQL code and data with others. Um, so we had more people that wanted SQL shared to them than wanted to share it necessarily. Um, and, you know, a lot of people who use our uh, individual user product um, also share data. So they share the export to Excel um, or CSVs, you know, to take that to other places or they want to pick it up in their BI tool like Tableau or Power BI. So today I want to talk about five fundamentals that um, we think about for collaboration. And if you come out of a background of um, software engineering, some of these will seem very, very familiar to you. Um, and you'll have probably read books about um, each one of these. There's been a lot of ink spilled for each. 
Um, so I'm just going to treat these at a high level. But, you know, we found that a lot of these are not practices that most analysts um, have today. So the first of these is uh, source code management. We'll talk a bit about clean code, um, the dry principle, uh, code reviews and documentation. So we asked, we took another survey of our users because we like to do discovery. And we asked, you know, how often do you need to share SQL code with someone else? And very few people never need to share SQL, right? There's very few people who, you know, do it all for themselves and they keep it all for themselves. Um, and in fact, you know, a high, high number of people also need to use SQL shared by someone else. Um, and so when we asked them, how do you actually share your source code? Now, if you have a software development background, you're probably used to sharing your, your code in Git um, or maybe something like GitLab or GitHub or Bitbucket. Most analysts don't share source SQL code in a code repository. Um, in fact, most of them save it on their local machine. Uh, if you're lucky, maybe they share it on a shared drive. And there's this big category of other. Um, other includes things like they put it in email or they uh, just share it to themselves in Slack. So they're copying and pasting uh, their SQL code into places where they can keep it later because they don't have, uh, and some users put all their SQL code into Excel spreadsheets. So they have Excel spreadsheets of their saved SQL uh, queries as a way to save it. Um, and some of them just save it in their query history where they can go back and then, and then look at that if they need it. So we, we think that, um, you know, sharing sort, you know, being able to save your source code has a number of things. I mean, there's here in this category, we think that, you know, you need to be able to not just share it with your colleagues, um, to be able to save it for yourself, to be able to go back and needs to support versioning. Um, so you can go back and look at the history. How did something change? Who made the change? Can you can compare changes? Can you roll back to a previous version? Um, are all, you know, requirements of a source code system. Um, and there's a number of ways that you can approach that. There's a number of um, source control systems that analysts can use. We actually built this into our product, um, but anything is better than saving it on your local machine. Uh, the second real fundamental, if you're going to have a collaborative practice um, and work with other an analysts, is clean code. And, you know, good code is simple. It's consistent. It's easy to read, and let me say it again, it's easy to read, <laughs> it implements best practices, and most importantly, it's easy to test and maintain. And, you know, <clears throat> one of the ways that we get at this is by um, adopting a style guide. So what are the practices for our organization? Um, and this can extend everything from um, naming conventions, um, how you treat aliases, uh, but also like, do we, you know, do, what's, our, what's our feelings about, um, you know, creating temp tables versus subqueries versus common table expressions. Um, and some of these will be platform dependent. What's the best practice for the platform that we're on? How are we going to work together um, when, we're, when we're needing to share code? Because all of us need to be able to read it and understand it if we're in the same organization. And so we, we adopt a style guide. We, you know, we get agreement on it um, and we implement that, you know, for the team. And one of the ways that we kind of instantiate that is with a code linter. So, um, you know, there are a number of these that are available, um, like SQL Fluff or um, SQL Lint. We've, you know, we have a, um, there's a number, there's a number of linters that are available on the market. But what that linter allows you to do is it allows you to take your um, things from your, from your style guide and implement those as rules that get checked, right? And so those checks run automatically for everyone that's on the team. Um, same thing with the code formatter. So what is the way that we, um, and, you know, you can start a, a war over this, but like, how do we treat commas uh, in SQL? Are they leading or trailing commas? And I will show you an example later on where I lost this debate, but the important thing was, it was more important than that we were in agreement on how we were going to do it um, than that we did it the particular way that I wanted to. Uh, but it needs to be re uh, readable and consistent for everybody. The third is this principle, don't repeat yourself. And, um, you know, as an organization, this is something that's that's super important to us. If you're a software developer, then um, 
you know, you know that this is, you know, what we call the, the bad version of this is what's called wet code right every time. And a lot, a lot of SQL analysts start from scratch every time, right? You get a new project, you get new data, select star from foo with, you know, to get a look at what is that, um, what does that data look like, right? And and then you iterate out from there. We oftentimes call this internally, we call this like the evolutionary SQL writer, right? And so you you write, run, write, run, uh, and you keep looking at the results until you eventually get um, the result that you need. And part of that is, is because um, a lot of SQL tools don't have any kind of package manager, right? And how can you get packaged SQL, right? If you're in the software world, then, you know, if you need to write something, the first oftentimes what you do is you look for libraries, like what libraries are available that I can take advantage of. And so um, we we have something called Kojandi Script that's in our, in our product that allows you to write modular SQL to break that up into packages. There are other tools like this out there on the market, things like Dataform, um, you know, to some lesser extent, some, something like Malloy um, that allow you to write modular and reusable SQL so that you don't have to start from scratch every time. And uh, so you can have commonly shared uh, code components or SQL components. So you're working from common data sets. Um, and so you get consistency. And the other thing you get is faster, right? Writing, writing from scratch every time uh, just makes the entire process longer. The other thing we're a big believer in for collaboration is code review. And one of the things that's important about some of these previous steps is when you have a linter and when you have a style guide, it takes um, it takes reviewing for style kind of out of the question, right? Those are already things that are agreed upon. So that when we do a code review, what we're focused on is um, the quality of the code. You know, is this is this performant? Um, is it relying on existing packages that we have? Is it um, relying on um, existing standards? Is it implementing best practices? Um, is it uh, using the, our common measures? So one of the things we want to do is make sure that, you know, the way that we calculate customer is consistent um, for everybody in our organization. Um, so, you know, in code reviews ser serve a number of purposes. They improve the code quality for, for everybody um, in the organization. Um, and it's a way that we level up people that are junior. So we do code reviews with more senior developers. Um, and so it helps us level up our, our junior um, SQL writers. And in our organization, everybody is a SQL writer, all the way up to the CEO. Um, it also supports knowledge transfer. So there's a shared understanding and there's a shared understanding of best practices. There's a shared understanding of our organizational data. Um, and, you know, we're able to share like techniques and best practices through the code review process. And then last is documentation. And this is um, oftentimes I think underestimated. I've, you know, I can't tell you like how many places I've been where I've gotten like, you know, a 2000 line SQL document and it has no comments in it whatsoever. Right. And, and it's left to the reader to try and figure out what's going on. And anyone who's had like really well documented code knows, you know, what a blessing that is that someone left for you. Um, and, you know, for us, um, we think that, you know, documentation should live with the code. So we think that, um, you know, there should be inline code uh, comments to explain like what you were doing, maybe what decisions you were made, why, why choices were made, um, maybe what's left to be done. And you know what does this thing do? Like, what's the what what's the result? What was the problem that we were trying to solve? Um, and we put all that documentation directly um, into our code base, so it's right next to the code, but either either in the code or next to it. But you know, one of the things this does is it helps onboard new users. So when when people join our organization, when they look at any of the, the code that's in our repository, um, they can read both the code and they can read the comments around that. Um, and it really makes the you know, support and maintenance a lot easier. So these are kind of three things that we talk about when collaboration isn't working. And these will seem familiar to anyone who's worked in the data and analytics space. So the first one is this thing we call analytic inconsistency. And anyone who's been a, 
I don't even know that you have to be a manager to have experienced this, but, you know, I always talk about the case of, you know, when you get a report from two different individuals and they give you different results, um, you know, they're based on the same data, but they say different things, right? And so we have this problem of inconsistency and, and that's because, you know, someone's used an equal rather than uh, equal to or greater than, or they didn't understand like how we calculate um, an active user, or they're using an old version of how we calculate an active user. Um, and that leads to analytic inconsistency. So when you can um, indicate like what are your, your best practice measures, um, then you minimize the amount of inconsistency you get in your analytic results. Um, the other is analytic drift. So analytic drift is where you get multiple versions of the same measure. Um, that that drift in meaning over time. So we did a assessment with a with a customer a couple of years ago, and we went in, and they had 29 different versions of customer. Um, and when you have 29 different versions of customer, you have a high degree of inconsistency. And a part of that is, you know, they do a, they were doing a lot of kind of copy and paste um, of, you know, how do we calculate customer? And so if I if I have the version that's from, you know, three years ago, then if that metric has changed and I haven't updated on that, um, then mine is severely out of date. Right. And, you know, you need a system where you can where you can keep those measures, um, you know, consistent and up to date to avoid this kind of drift. And then the uh, third one is orphan analytics and orphan analytics are things that were built once and never used again. Right. So you put you put a lot of effort into building this thing and you hear a lot of people in the um uh, in the in the kind of BI world, complain about this with dashboards. You know, we built this dashboard, we used it once, and then it just lives out in this dash this dashboard graveyard. Um, and so, you know, we want to we want to um, emphasize a lot of uh, reuse. And so, a lot of time, things I, times I say to you know new users, like if you're writing a CTE, consider whether or not you want to turn that CTE into a block that can be reused. Right? Can we save that into our catalog? Um, so that we can make future use out of that, or are you going to have to write that CT every time you do, you know, you go to write a query? All right. So collaboration and practice. This is where I'll talk about, you know, what we actually do um, in house. Because on the one hand, we're messaging this um, outside, and we have this tool that we're building for um, collaboration. But we're also um, a startup ourselves. Um, and so we have our own internal data needs. And like a lot of startups, we have growing challenges. Um, so we we picked a lot of tools um, for our independent departments. And so, you know, our support team uses Zendesk for responding to tickets. Uh, our product team uses Pindo um, to measure both product adoption, but it also allows us to send in-app messages and things like that. Our sales team uses HubSpot as a CRM. And our marketing team uses Google Analytics, and they also use HubSpot. And all of these tools have uh, metrics and dashboards that are built into them, and they will get you some way. So, you know, I can go to my support team and I can say, you know, how many tickets did we get last week? What's our close rate uh, on those tickets? Um, what's our SLA response time? We can go into, um, into Pindo and we can see, like, what our product feature usage is. But we couldn't answer questions like, uh, for a particular customer, uh, you know, how many tickets have they opened this week, um, you know, across all of their users? Or for, you know, for a particular customer, uh, what's the feature adoption or what does the usage adoption look like across all of their users? Because we didn't have cross connects between these systems. Um, and so uh, we did what a lot of people do. Uh, we started to implement our own. Uh, internal data warehouse. And so we call this project Snoopy, which is our dog fooding uh, project. I don't know if everyone's old enough to know who Snoopy is. Uh, <laughs> the cartoon dog. Um, and so, you know, we took all of those applications that worked independently and we adopted Fivetran because, which is a very easy choice. Um, rather than try to build our own, our own pipelines, um, you know, we wanted to, they have a fairly well documented data models for everything that they land. Um, so we adopted Fivetran to land all that data in Snoopy. And in two days, uh, we had all of our data fed um, from all these independent apps and to Snowflake, um, which was not 
of course, efficient because now we had, uh, you know, eight different schemas for these different data sets. So now we had to go build something on top of that. Um, and so for this, um, we pulled subject matter experts from each of our teams, uh, from, from marketing, from product, from our go-to-market team, um, from engineering, so that we could get, you know, an understanding of what the business is, right? What, how, what are the definitions that are within HubSpot or Zendesk? What do these fields actually mean? Um, we hired an analyst and an analytics engineer to help accelerate that, to do some of the work. Um, and we went about um, establishing our own best practices. And so we adopted a style guide. And I say iterate here because uh, you don't get your best practices best right out of the gate, right? So uh, this is a continuous improvement project. So as we learn more, we update our practices and propagate those back out to the organization. And then the other thing we wanted to do is we wanted to give everyone in the, act, in the organization access um, to answer questions um, out of Snoopy. So this is, a, this is an organizational wide effort. And when we did that, you know, once we landed the data via Fivetran, we had to think about like, how did we want to organize this um, within, within our data warehouse? And so um, we have a long experience with, with or, you know, some people in our organization did with uh, ELT patterns. And so, you know, we were landing data in the TISA a decade ago. So we land all the raw data um, in the Snowflake and the people that have access to that are analytics engineers and and um, our data analysts and mostly what they have access to is that we create a cleansed view on top of that that normalizes business names um, and uh, normalizes to our naming convention so we create this stage layer across landing and so everyone in the organization has access to this stage layer uh, that has comp that has a common na naming conventions um, and you know what that allowed us to do is immediately we were able to start building um, into our reporting layer on top of that. So, and then we have a core and our core is a kind of cross domain Kimball-esque uh, facts and dimensions. <laughs> so uh, the first thing we built was we built two tables. One is a date dimension and the other was um, a user dimension. And what that allowed us to do is our user dimension uh, has the keys across Pindo, uh, Zendesk, HubSpot, and so it, can, it acts as a cross-joining table. So now if you want to be able to, you know, join data from the stage layer um, for any of those, you can you can do that from, from core. Um, and then our reporting layer is where we, um, you know, land, we create tabular data for consumption for downstream tools like Power BI and Excel and, and Census. Um, and this is actually the only layer that Census has access to. So this is our this is the where we do all of our work. This is uh, Kajani Premium, and it has our built-in uh, catalog, which allows us to manage packages and to share code. Um, and so we have um, a user space where everyone can do scratch work. They can create their own packages. They can save um, their own analytics that they've needed to work on. We have uh, departmental spaces. So here within the analytics team, we have some um, administrative queries that are parameterized that allow people to, you know, they can run those, they just put in a name. And um, and then we have our, our uh, shared corporate space, which has packaged analytics that then um, can be used for people to build on top of. And so here you see our package imports, we can import um, here, this is from the Pindo utilities, and we use those. Um, we have the documentation, which is standard across all of our SQL as who's the author, what's the documentation, what's the publication strategy for this? Do we create a, um, a table or a view? Um, we have the ability to um, uh, write to external table, I'm sorry, write to um, file. And then we use those packages um, and we have standard formatting across this. And so everybody in our organization has the ability to come in, use these standard um, analytics, use these, these standard um, definitions and then uh, we have you'll notice that there's a full review um, folder here so this is where people can submit things for review to go into the our company wide space so we'll create a package on that and the way that we work is um, our analytics role here is a player coach 
Um, so we don't expect that our analytics engineer or our analysts build everything that's in our warehouse. And, um, you know, our subject matter experts, you know, they have the ability to explain domain, domain and the domain logic, um, our business rules to our analytics engineers. But our analytics engineers really act as a, as a coach back to the organization. And so when people submit code um, for review, they, um, they give them feedback on it and um, they help them improve it. And the expectation is not that the analytics engineer is rewriting that for the user, but that the user is actually getting better and taking the feedback, rewriting it. Uh, and when it gets to the point where it's ready, we will put it into um, our, our packaged corporate level um, analytics. And so anything that we then use um, uh, to output from a BI or anything like that is run through that, that review process. And so then we wanted to bring it full circle because now we had all kinds of other data and questions that we were able to answer. And we wanted to put that back into the tool. So it was right at the fingertips of the users that need it, um, whether that's in Zendesk or in HubSpot um, or in Pindo. Um, and so, and the way that works is these are all in census, they're select star statements from our report layer um, because everything that comes through is then governed on, on the inside. And um, we make sure that we, we govern the way the analytic is done. And then the owners of those, those applications then actually have the ability to set up the census sync because they know the internals of their application um, um, better. So, and, and really this has enriched the reporting that was in there uh, is now, you know, we can now answer questions. So someone who's in Zendesk can say like, oh, I can see that this person, um, what features that they've used, what their, um, what their current licensing is, um, what's the latest version of the software that they're on, and they don't have to then pivot. They, there's no pivot problem. They don't have to go to another tool to be able to get that data. Um, we, there are a couple of lessons learned in implementing this. Um, you have a window in which you do a sync to a production system. And so one of the things we learned is to test those on a sandbox. Uh, sometimes APIs have um, undocumented fields that also get updated when you make an API call. Uh, like last updated, <laughs> uh, which we found out the hard way. Um, we were able to go back and fix it, but we now have a process where um, we try it. We do syncs first to a sandbox account uh, for testing before we productionalize it, um, where, where those sandboxes are available. And we also do a single row update because you have a window in which you're going to see that update go out to uh, Zendesk or HubSpot, and then it's going to flow all the way back through um, into your data warehouse. Um, and so you have this window for us, it's about six hours in which to, to see that flow. So, thank you. I mean, there's people out there clapping. This is the worst thing about these online conferences. It doesn't matter how well you perform, it's uh, nobody, no, no feedback. But I, I really enjoyed that. Um, I think first thing I'm going to do is address the uh, the I had to put a poll when you kind of spoke to style guides and leading and trailing commas, and I am disappointed and shocked by this audience's uh, opinions. They split dead even down the middle to uh, whether like literally four to four trailing versus leading. Uh, I will let you be the tiebreaker, and then I will break the tie it back if you say the wrong answer. Uh, I'm a leading commas person. My organization is a trailing commas person. I saw that. I saw that there was trailing commas in your code example. Well, I, I think that we will, we are now, if we have five and five, I've, I remain on the trailing commas because I uh, like write in English and think in English. Uh, you like the readability, yeah. It's like pausing before a sentence. Like it doesn't make any sense. I. Anyways, we got a couple of questions here. Uh, one I want to address for Mr. Josh Richman. Josh Richman, a uh, um, an awesome community member here. Do you think it's more helpful to do? This is a great question. Do live code reviews, which means scheduling set times, or async code reviews, which means you can review when you're able, um, but there's less opportunity for discussion. I think uh, live code reviews are, are awesome because they accelerate um, and they bring up more question. Um, but, you know, it's not, it, you know, for us as a 100% remote organization, it's not always possible um, to do those to do those because of the window. 
um, mm -hmm. of opportunity. So yeah, I do think that like live code reviews are, are awesome, especially um, with with more junior um, SQL writers. Yeah, that totally makes sense. I feel like there is like getting people to think, I want to say think straight and, and like organize and lint and all that stuff. Uh, and then there's like, does this make sense type reviews, which are like, you know, yeah, that's a, yeah. Um, I think that's a really helpful distinction. Earlier on, you're teaching SQL. Later on, you're just kind of verifying, verifying things. Um, I, this really great question from a guy named Trevor Fox is, how did you get your organization to adopt SQL as a common language? I think one thing that you mentioned about like everybody writes SQL. Uh, you have people, the end users of the systems, when the data is synced back out to say Zendesk, they're thinking about data in terms of tables. Is that a selection thing or are you educating people on the way in or how, or are you just really technical organizations? Yes. Uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's, a bit of, there's a bit of all that. So like our CEO is a former data architect and, you know, we make software for SQL. So, you know, we have kind of deep roots in that world and we make mm -hmm. it a, it's not a hiring requirement. Um, it's a hiring requirement that you'd be open to learning it. Um, yeah. so we have a preference for you already knowing SQL. If you don't know SQL, we will teach you SQL because whether you're in marketing or customer success or sales, um, you need to understand, you know, what the experience of the analyst is for our organization. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things that was so important about putting this dog fooding together is that I don't think that like a lot of our, our internal people could really understand our end user without having sat in that seat and had that experience. Um, and so being, being that we sell data and analytics tooling, um, it's just, you know, it's just, a, you know, everyone needs to be able to, to sit in that seat. And, you know, and sometimes that means feeling that pain. hundred um, percent. Yeah. I, I, I want to say like, Hey, it's a great model, but I also realize how like just impossible this is to scale, like how much it, but, you know, if you can make it part of the the bones of the the system, then then that's that's great. I think we have a strong foundation. We'll see. You know, we're forty people now. We'll see what it looks like when we're four hundred. Um, yeah. Well, best of luck uh, on your way there. Um, also, I don't think people are too old for Snoopy, but I think there will be a day when like people are naming their data warehouse Paw Patrol, and that's going to blow my mind. So, uh, there's maybe people who are too young to understand that because they don't have kids yet uh, but yeah. we'll see, we'll see how it. that goes yeah <laughs> um well it's been it's been great hearing from you thanks for laying it all out for us i uh, appreciate that and um so does all the do all the folks here we are going to take a short break now and we will be back in something like 20 or 30 seconds with mr stephen oh god every ebry which not if, if i'm right stephen well, we'll we'll figure it out later. Matthew Mullins, thanks again for the talk, and uh, we'll see you on uh, the Slack community. See you thanks, Trevor.